Good afternoon. It's the 1st of April. I'm Erin Viner, and this is IBA News Broadcasting from Jerusalem. Contradictory viewpoints continue to come out of Luzon today as the West resumed talks with Iran aimed at curbing its nuclear program. French diplomats say that the talks are not ripe for an imminent deal, while those from Russia and Iran are claiming that there's been a significant breakthrough. With a deadline for a preliminary deal already having passed, it's unclear whether the sides will succeed in compiling a comprehensive agreement with the Islamic Republic by the end of June. IBA's Marco Dukevich has been monitoring the talks and brings us this report. The deadline for a preliminary deal between Iran and the six world powers to restrict its nuclear program came and went. Frenzied negotiations between the P5 plus one diplomats in Iran went past the midnight deadline last night. The date set to strike a preliminary agreement, with sessions continuing into the early hours of this morning and reconvening hours later. The diplomats avoided all mention of an extension of the talks. Russia's Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov issued a statement today saying all key aspects of a final settlement had been agreed upon in principle and would possibly be put down on paper sometime today and a joint statement issued. He suggested the terms will provide a comprehensive approach to a possible agreement that will include the International Atomic Energy Agency's control over Tehran's nuclear program as well as steps to lift sanctions. Britain's Foreign Minister Philip Hammond said this morning that some key issues have to be worked out. Before returning to Beijing, China's Foreign Minister Wang Yi called for a compromise agreement, stressing the importance in narrowing down the differences. He outlined a four-point plan and called on all sides to display creative thinking and consider all-inclusive resolution plans. He left his deputy in Lausanne to continue the talks. France's Foreign Minister Laurent Fabius left the Swiss venue last night to participate in a cabinet meeting in Paris, with officials saying he will return as soon as his presence is deemed useful, suggesting that perhaps not all the sides are in agreement. Iranian negotiator Hamid Baidinejad said no efforts are being spared to reach an agreement, adding the issue of sanctions has yet to be resolved. We have a deal when all issues are resolved. There are unresolved issues at this moment which have not been resolved. We are concentrating on uh, finding the best solutions which are mutually agreed by everybody. And this, uh, these efforts would be continued until we have those solutions. So we do not have any artificial deadline, uh, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, 9 o'clock. For us, the, the, the whole day uh, can end in the next morning. So we are uh, sparing no effort to, to find the best solutions. U.S. President Barack Obama held a video conference with U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry and other officials, receiving an update on the negotiations. White House Press Secretary Josh Erna said talks with Iran will continue as long as they are deemed productive. Now, the President's been very clear that we've been having these conversations for more than a year now. Uh, the international community, standing alongside the United States, is seeking very specific and very serious commitments from the Iranians to shut down every pathway they have to a nuclear weapon uh, and to agree to intrusive inspections to verify their compliance with the agreement. Uh, our negotiators are engaged in um, serious negotiations that have been going on for not just over the course of the last year, which is relevant here, uh, but also over the last day. They've been engaged in very serious negotiations. Well, I think it's fair to say that we've reached our limit right now in in as far as well in as far as the conversations have been going on for more than a year we've established this deadline for trying to reach a political agreement where by we would have a framework that would guide the technical negotiations that would have to continue uh, into June but at the same time uh, it also doesn't make sense if we are uh, getting serious engagement from the other side to just abruptly uh, end the talks the West view a preliminary accord as a major milestone towards signing in a final agreement with Tehran by the end of June. If no significant progress is made, any deadlock may spur the U.S. Congress in speeding up its plans to impose new sanctions on the Islamic Republic. 
a move U.S. President Barack Obama may find hard to block. This could result in the weakening of America's status in the eyes of the world and also pose problems for Iranian President Hassan Rouhani, whose opponents oppose all dealings with the United States and many powers in the West. Margot Dudkevich, IBA News. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu today repeated his warning about a possible nuclear accord with Iran, saying that the world must insist on a better deal that links concessions to a change in Tehran's actions. Meanwhile, the 20th Knesset began work and then he immediately went on vacation. Here with more is IBA's political correspondent, Eli Wogelander. Prime Minister Netanyahu reacted with outrage this afternoon over comments made by a senior Iranian military official that, quote, Israel's destruction is non-negotiable, and Netanyahu slammed the ongoing negotiations with Iran as leading to a weak deal that will endanger not only Israel, but other nations. Yesterday, an Iranian general brazenly declared, and I quote, Israel's destruction is non-negotiable. But evidently, giving Iran's murderous regime a clear path to the bomb is negotiable. This is unconscionable. I agree with those who have said that Iran's claim that its nuclear program is only for peaceful purposes doesn't square with Iran's insistence on keeping underground nuclear facilities, advanced centrifuges, and a heavy water reactor. Nor does it square with Iran's insistence on developing ICBMs and its refusal to come clean with the IEA on its past weaponization efforts. At the same time, Iran is accelerating its campaign of terror, subjugation, and conquest throughout the region, most recently in Yemen. The concessions offered to Iran in Luzon would ensure a bad deal that would endanger Israel, the Middle East, and the peace of the world. Now is the time for the international community to insist on a better deal. A better deal would significantly roll back Iran's nuclear infrastructure. A better deal would link the eventual lifting of the restrictions on Iran's nuclear program to a change in Iran's behavior. Iran must stop its aggression in the region, stop its terrorism throughout the world, and stop its threats to annihilate Israel. That should be non-negotiable. And that's the deal that the world powers must insist upon. Thank you. Meanwhile, the 20th Knesset began work today, a day after the festive swearing-in ceremony, and a host of new bills were presented. Ayala Chaked seeks to remove the current ban on political propaganda advertisements on radio and television in the 60 days preceding a national election. Chaked explained that new media has changed the way the communication media works, and that in today's reality, an absurd situation has resulted in which there is a ban on television and radio propaganda, while the same limitation is not imposed on Internet websites. Other new laws proposed include mandating the death penalty for terrorists, annexing the West Bank, shortening coalition talks, and curbing rent hikes. And the Speaker of the 19th Knesset, Yuli Edelstein of Likud, will serve in the same position in the 20th Knesset as well. Edelstein was chosen for the position by an overwhelming majority last night, with 103 MKs voting in favor. There were no objections and only seven abstentions, all by MKs from the joint Arab list. Following the vote, Edelstein thanked the members of the Knesset for their trust in him, saying, I would like to address specifically the newcomers among you who number a third of the members of the Knesset. Please treat this place as a sacred place. Do not let the detractors and cynics distract you and weaken your hands. Shoulder the burden of the people. Be attentive to the public, even when you fulfill certain roles here. Always place the citizens and, and their concerns at the front. There was one momentary hiccup in the voting. Likud MK Sylvan Shalom accidentally pressed the button opposing, but immediately announced it was a mistake. And soon after, he tweeted, wishing the new old Knesset speaker good luck. The plenum also voted on the makeup of the Knesset's Arrangements Committee, which will run the Knesset's administrative duties until a new government is formed. The committee decided that the Knesset will begin its standard Passover and Independence Day holiday recess starting today and lasting through May 3rd. All factions voted in favor except for the Zionist Union. So it was one day of work and then off to vacation. Good work if you can get it. Aaron? 
Thanks for that report. Well, just a short time ago, Prime Minister Netanyahu met with visiting Speaker of the U.S. Congress, John Boehner, who invited him to address a joint session of the House last month without the knowledge of the White House that led to the current strain in relations between Washington and Jerusalem. Following the meeting, both men spoke about the deep friendship between the two countries. In this violent and unstable region, where states are imploding and fanaticism is exploding, one thing remains rock solid, our friendship, our alliance, our partnership. It makes both our countries stronger. It makes both our countries safer. And it's the anchor for our shared hopes for peace and stability in this region. Uh, our delegation uh, is uh, uh, spent the last uh, five days throughout the Middle East. And, uh, and regardless of where in the Middle East we've been, uh, the message has been the same. Uh, you can't continue to turn uh, your eye away from the threats uh, that face all of us. And uh, as you said, uh, the bonds between the United States and Israel are as strong as ever. Uh, our two countries cooperate on many different levels. And while we may have political disagreements from time to time, uh, the bonds between our two nations uh, are strong. And they're going to continue to be strong. The danger of Iran's retaining nuclear capability was also the main topic of discussion during a meeting President Reuven Rivlin hosted at his official residence in Jerusalem today with a congressional delegation of six led by the chairman of the Tactical Land and Air Forces Subcommittee of the House Armed Services Committee, Michael Turner. We are very much worried about uh, the uh, ability of Iran uh, to have a uh, nuclear uh, weapons and to have uh, the idea that uh, they can uh, have the ability uh, to produce uh, those uh, uh, nuclear um, arms. And uh, of course it is not the problem of Israel only. So we are doing our best in order to let everyone understand. We are talking to everyone. We are talking to the Europeans and we are talking to the Russians and to the Chinese people. In other news, the Palestinians today formally joined the International Criminal Court as part of a broader effort to heighten international pressure on Israel and exact a price for the so-called occupation of Palestinian lands. Leaders of the Palestinian Authority have threatened to bring war crimes charges at the court against Israeli officials and also want the United Nations Security Council to set a deadline for the withdrawal of Israeli troops. A legal and diplomatic showdown is not inevitable, however. Aides to PA President Mahmoud Abbas say that he's not interested in an all-out confrontation with Jerusalem out of concern that allegations of war crimes could then also be lodged against Hamas and, by extension, the Palestinian Authority, which formed a unity government with the terror organization last year. The court had already begun a preliminary examination, and we hope that those who are trying to pressure Palestine not to make reference to the court. We are the victims here. They should go to the uh, criminals and ask them to stop committing crimes. Settlement activities, dictations, demolishing of homes, the continuation of occupation are all war crimes and Israel will be held accountable. We are seeking to have the state of Palestine take its case through the international law mechanisms, void of violence, and I hope that this, the, the, the international community will stand shoulder to shoulder with us as Palestinians in, in pursuing to maintain the two-state solution. In Israel today, there is an elected prime minister who said the establishment of a Palestinian state is not on my watch. State prosecutors in Buenos Aires have filed their second appeal to pursue the case against President Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner to overturn previous court decisions to dismiss charges that she conspired to cover Iran's alleged role in the 1994 bombing of the Jewish Community Center. Kirchner was exonerated by a review panel in March as well as a judge in February who ruled that there was not enough evidence to launch a formal investigation. The latest motion was brought to Argentina's top appeals court by newly appointed prosecutor German Moldes, who helped to organize a march of tens of thousands last month in a tribute to Alberto Nisman, the state prosecutor who initiated the allegations against Kirchner January 14th and was found dead under suspicious circumstances just four days later. 
After a 21-month suspension, the United States is restoring its supply of military equipment to Egypt. Citing his administration's supportive efforts to combat terrorism, U.S. President Barack Obama informed his Egyptian counterpart, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, in a telephone call that Washington will send 12 F-16 jets, 20 missiles, and as many as 125 tank kits. Obama also told Sisi that he will continue to press Congress to reinstate the $1.3 billion military aid package that was frozen when the army, then headed by Sisi, overthrew the Arab Republic's first democratically elected Islamist president, Mohamed Morsi, in 2013. Cairo maintains that Washington's financial support is critical to its efforts to form a unified Arab military force to confront Iranian allied rebels in Yemen as well as radical Islamist infiltrators from Libya and terrorists in the Sinai. Iraqi troops and Shiite paramilitary fighters are reportedly making advances in the battle to retake Tikrit. A spokesman for Iraq's Prime Minister, Haider al-Abadi, is proclaiming victory over the Islamic State who seized the city last June. Military, military officials say that the forces have regained control of the governor's headquarters in addition to the western and southern sectors of the city that was the hometown of former dictator Saddam Hussein. The campaign began nearly a month ago and showed signs of stalling until the United States backed the offensive with airstrikes earlier this week. The newly appointed successor to John Stewart on Comedy Central's late-night American satirical Daily Show has found himself at the center of controversy. Trevor Noah is facing allegations of anti-Semitism and misogyny over comments that he's made on Twitter. The 31-year-old comic says that to reduce his views to a handful of jokes that didn't land isn't a true reflection of his character nor his evolution as a comedian. Noah regularly uses his own mixed race in his routine. He's the son of a white, Swiss-German father, and he told Australia's Herald Sun that his mother is a black South African woman who's half Jewish. Among the comments causing offense are a 2009 tweet in which Noah said that he almost bumped into a Jewish kid crossing the road and he would have felt so bad had he hit him with his German car. In 2014, he also posted that behind every successful rap billionaire is a double as a rich Jewish man and South Africa knows how to recycle like Israel knows how to be peaceful. Turning to financial matters, and a new minimum wage has gone into effect as part of the first stage of a plan to raise salaries incrementally. As of today, monthly rates will jump from 4,300 shekels to 4,650. On the 1st of August, minimum wage will increase to 4,825 going up to an even 5000 by January 1, 2017. The Finance Ministry says that the agreement will cost the economy an estimated 1.3 billion shekels a year. Officials at the Histadrut Labor Federation say that they are still not fully satisfied with the agreement and intend to push for further increases reaching 5,300 shekels per month by the end of 2017. In other money matters, the shekel today put in a mixed performance while share prices on the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange were up across the board. Here's a look at the afternoon numbers. The IBA weather team tells us that we can expect a slight rise in temperatures tomorrow under fair to partly cloudy skies. Here's the forecast at home and abroad over the next 24 hours. Thank you for being with us this afternoon. Laura Cornfield will be at this desk tomorrow to bring you the latest breaking news from Israel. I'm Aaron Viner wishing you a great evening and shalom from Jerusalem.